I love to step back and discover people from a different place and time. Well, I was just going through some things that Anne inherited from her grandmother, Josephine Parker, and just looking through her collection, I've discovered quite a bit about Josephine. Now, Josephine was just a mite of a woman. She was just four foot eleven, but she was tall in value and virtues. This is a photograph of Josephine with her husband Everett, and on their lap is their little son Lester. Lester is Anne's father. Now, they lived in a rural area in Woods, Oregon. They raised chickens and they had a cow. Now their house was very simple but comfortable. They had a wood-burning stove and an outhouse. Anne remembers those trips to the outhouse with the Sears catalog. Now our grandmother Josephine gave a piece of her wedding dress, some of the lace from her wedding dress, to Anne so she could use it in her photo album. Oh, what a treasure. Well, you could tell that Josephine was very meticulous just looking at her handwork. Now, this is a pillowcase that she monogrammed right here. Oh, what a beautiful P for Parker. Perfect work. And then she did some crocheting, added that lace right to the bottom of the pillowcase. Now, before they had electricity, Josephine did her sewing on a treadle sewing machine, often to the light of a kerosene lamp. Well, for years, she cut quilt patterns out of newspapers. Oh, what a collection. Now this one, you'll recognize this one. This one is the Dutch windmill. She cut this out of the journal on May 29th, 1936. This is one of Mary Collins' patterns. That one's great. Well, she also collected applique patterns as well. Didn't matter, pieced patterns or applique. This one is from the Oregonian. This one is one of my favorites, the little Scotty dog. It's just a great pattern. Well, this one is a whole collection that she found. It was called the Parade of States Quilt. This was from Ruby McKim's studio. This particular one is called Wagon Tracks, probably because her husband Everett came from Indiana to Oregon in a wagon train. Or how about this one? Appropriate as well, Delectable Mountains. Oh, what a great piece of, of uh, quilting. And tucked in with all of her quilt patterns was a piece of music, one of her favorite hymns. Perhaps she hum it as she was quilting away. Well, collections tell so much about the collector. I wish I knew Josephine Parker. You know, many women took those patterns that they cut out of newspapers. They would make perhaps a single block just to test the pattern, find out if they liked it, if it was easy enough for them, or perhaps they were thinking about making a whole quilt. Stacks of these single blocks exist, and you can sew them into great samplers. Oh, you can find them everywhere. In the attic, you can buy them in an antique store, or your family or friends might even give you a stack. But as you gather them, put them together according to their age. Oh, it's fun to tell. Now, this is one of my favorite stacks. Every block is a different size. Now, when you look at this print right here, this black with the white running through it, this one is definitely 1880 to 1925. This was known as a morning print. Oh, what a great name. Now, the Montgomery Ward catalog in 1889 referred it to as half morning pieces. What? funny things to call it. It was for elderly women who were not in mourning. Now the black was great and also the reds. Oh, they were usually turkey red or perhaps double pink as this one is or even an orange red. Oh, look at these pieces. They're great. Now every one of these was hand stitched. Actually, I think they're going to need to have some repair work on them before I sew them into a sampler. And what a challenge because every one is a different size. Well, the black was short-lived, and then we were into the Depression years and the pastel prints. Ooh, I found a great stack 
of Dresden plate blocks, all with all their soft pastels, bubblegum pink in the center. Now I took this and I washed it in Orvis soap. And then when I was done washing it, I soaked it for a while, washed it, and then I put it out on the grass. Oh, you can do some grass bleaching. Something they did for many years because the chlorine in the grass mixed with the rays from the sun makes this nice and white. Now you can also take stains out of your block by washing it with lemon juice or buttermilk. But beware because whatever you wash it in, you will destroy the fabric, the fibers just a bit. Be very careful on what you decide to wash it with. Now this is a collection from my Scheidemental family. Oh, I love the pieces. Little bit newer, this is like from the, eight, uh, from the 1940s, 1950s. And when you look at it, you can tell that this piece, just by touching it, is from a feed sack. It's nubby in texture. And this one is a piece of fabric because it's much smoother. Now I thought that these nine patch would look great set together with a feed sack from the same farm. Oh, that's great. Can't wait to finish it. Now on for a more contemporary look. This one is Loretta Smith's quilt and I just love it. Now she belongs to a group of online quilters. This is a computer group that talk to each other through their computers. She sent out the word to send a collection of blocks about ships, ships and boats. And these are the blocks that she received back in her block swap. Then she set them together into one great quilt. Well, I'm anxious to take these blocks and see what we can do with them. What a challenge these blocks represent. Well, the first challenge was to find a fabric that went with them, and oh, I am really pleased with this. Now, this is a reproduction line of fabrics from the 1880s to the early 1900s, and they are actual replicas of fabric that's in the Smithsonian Institute. Oh, I love the bright red, all the browns and the greens, and this black with a little touch of green in it just seemed to go so well. Well, I looked at my blocks and, oh my gosh, they look so dirty. I couldn't wait to soak them and wash them. Well, that was fine. The washing went well, but then in the drying, I looked at this block and I said, this is a sorry looking block. I've really got to do something with this. So it is truly amazing what you can do just with a little pressing. I like to use steam in my iron, and I put some spray starch on it. Now you might want to go ahead and mix up some spray starch. I'm not really great at mixing up my spray starch, but use some steam, use some spray starch. Look at that. It's sometimes amazing what you can do. Well, all of the grains are just off a bit in this block. Might want to turn it over on the back side. There's a little stretching right in that triangle. But once you get your blocks washed and starched, they are ready for going. Well, next, go ahead and square up your blocks. This block looks pretty straight. Actually, I'm quite impressed with it. It's hard to imagine what the quilt maker was doing when she made it, isn't it? But when I look on one side, this is about nine and a half inches here, but you can see it's sticking over nine and a half on the other side. So what I'm going to do is just go ahead, line up this square up, and just trim off on these two sides. Actually trim off a bit of those jagged edges, turn it around, and then go ahead and do one more trimming. Let me get this on the mat. Gosh, I'm not even going to get that edge straight. Can you imagine? the quilt maker using a rotary cutter and a square up to do this block. Okay, now the block is trimmed at nine and a half inches. And what I need to do is get each one of the blocks to an even size, to size that I want to work with. So I decided that I'd make all of these blocks 11 inches. So you've got to do some math. Take a calculator, the size of our block, that we want is 11 inches. So I'm just going to do 11 point, let's add some zeros there. Now this size of the block at this point is nine and a half. So I'm going to take away 9.5 equals. Okay, so we've got 1.5. We have to increase this by 1.5. Well, we've got two sides. So why don't we just go ahead and divide it by two. And now we've got a strip that's 0.75 or like three quarters of an inch. Well, let's remember our seam allowance. So let's just go ahead plus 
0.50, which is a half inch. And if we're lucky, oh my goodness, our strip needs to be cut at one and a quarter inches. Boy, I hope that was right. I hope you're, I hope you're better at math than I am. But I think we should cut a strip that's 1.25, one and a quarter. That is a narrow little strip. Well, I've got the fabric all lined up. I'm just going to take that 6 by 24 inch ruler, trim off that torn edge right there, make a narrow strip at one and a quarter. Let's see, line that up. Oh yes, it looks great. Okay, now the block was cut at nine and a half inches. We can just go ahead and take this strip and square off those salvage edges. Let me get this lined up right here. Square off the salvage edges and cut it first. Square off and cut it at at nine and a half. Let me see, right there is nine and a half. Okay, and then the next two strips, if we want to have this block measure 11 inches, we can just go ahead and cut those right now. They're ready to sew right onto the side so we can add to them. Let me move some things away, especially my calculator. Now take the nine and a half inch strip and just put it right sides together Use that quarter of an inch seam allowance. Oh, this is just a perfect narrow framing. I love it. Bright red colors. And to line it up at the edge, quarter inch, back stitch on the outside, and then just sew to the two opposite sides. Match it down there. So I'm just going to sew it on this side, back stitch it again, and this piece will go here. And then I'm just going to go ahead, press it out, but then the nine and a half goes on the opposite side, pressed out, and then this 11 inch strip is just going to go from edge to edge. So I completely framed it. I'm bringing all the blocks up to 11 inches. Well, we've got something equal to start with. Now, once we get each block framed, let me show you some of them that I stacked up here. See, this one's been framed. What a great block with the green right here. This one has a little bit wider of a frame, smaller block, wider frame, brought it up to 11 inches. Now on this one, I put just a narrow frame. I'm gonna put one more frame around it, one more set of strips to bring this up to 11 inches. But then, this is the best part. I'm going to add this frame and miter the corners. See how perfect that is with the green and then this two inch mitered frame going around it. Another piece right here. Different size. Ooh, I love these blocks. I can't wait to get done. Okay, so cut whatever fabric you're going to turn into a, into a frame and cut it so that you've allowed for the miter. Now, if this is a two inch wide strip and the miter has to be at least that on each side, go ahead and cut this strip at 15 and a half inches. This is at 15 and a half inches. You need to have four of these for each block and then just take them and sew them. Oh my gosh, I already did my sewing right here. See if I could pull this one up. Started on this one so you can see it. But take your strip and place it so that you have at least a two inch piece hanging up over the top. This is two inches wide so there has to be two inches wide hanging at the top and put your pin so that it's one fourth inch from the end, like that. And we're gonna do all of the sewing so we have this one fourth inch loose right up there. Let me just go ahead and put this in. Now this is the debate right here on the miter, to back stitch or not. Some people actually like to not back stitch because sometimes you wanna just pull out one stitch right along there so that the miter lays flat. And I'm just gonna go right down here and once again I'm gonna stop one fourth inch from the end. Let me just stick a pin right in there because I can see that. Oh, can't resist. Just a bit of a back stitch. And then trim that off. I've got it on all four sides. There it is right there. You can see it right here. It stopped one fourth inch. Now once you have these strips on all four sides, let's open it out and line it up so that you can push the seam 
away from that strip. Oh, this is perfect. Push that back just to expose that quarter inch right there. And I'm going to use my 6 by 12 because it's smaller and more convenient. And line up the 45 degree line right along the bottom of that strip and the long part of it up with the block. Let's just do a little bit of tweaking right here. Actually, this is a lot like the miter that I showed you on Dutch windmills. Okay, now go ahead, take a mark or something that you can see and draw a line from that quarter inch point right out. That's a perfect 45 degree angle. And then once you have that in place, take a pin just to hold those edges together see how good I am at this. Gosh, I really like this quilt. I hope it turns out perfect. When I first looked at some of the blocks, I thought, oh my gosh, look at that quilt maker. Look what she did. Those points are cut off or she didn't match that seam. Thought about fixing all of the blocks and I said, no, I have to leave it. Leave it all in its original state just to see how it looks. Well, I think I might look first. See if that's a perfect miter right in there. Oh, all right, looking good. See, there's that straight strip going in there. There's the miter right there. Great not to have that stitch in there so you can just push that flat. Now, all I really need to do with this is just cut this one quarter inch away from that miter and then press this out flat. Gosh, I have quite a few blocks that I need to get the mitering frame on. I am ripping now. You know, some of these blocks have waited a hundred years to get finished, and I think I'm going to finish them soon. It was so much fun to do. Now, I want to show you the back side of this one, just to see. This is the back side of the block. Oh, look at that hand stitching throughout there. This is an old block. Now, this is the first set of strips that I added around the block to bring it up to 11 inches. And then I added that two inch strip on all four sides and mitered those corners. Oh, what a perfect finish. They look so good. Next, I selected a piece for the lattice and it ties all of the fabrics together. I cut it into two and a half inch strips and then I sewed it to the bottom. Now, if I had all 12 blocks done, I would have sewn it to the bottom of nine of them. But I'm getting anxious. I only finished six blocks, but I have to show you and then I'll go on. So sew it to the bottom of nine blocks. Leave the last three without lattice on them. Now we can lay out our rows. It's going to be three across and four down for 12 blocks. And just place them like this. Oh, as I look at each one, you know, when I started this project, I thought they were just a bunch of dirty old blocks. And now the more that I work on them, the more fun I'm having, I'll tell you. Now see with the lattice on the bottom, when you go down, now we're going to sew that together right there. And then this is going to be the next piece right here going together. And then this piece right here. So you sew three rows with four down. Join them up. And then you go into some long pieces. This is a long two and a half inch piece of lattice. First we're going to sew it to the left side of the first row. Oh, this is getting tricky. Then you need to have a second lattice to the left side of the second row. And the third row actually gets a lattice on both sides. On first on the right side and on the left side. So it's completely framed. Ooh, that looks good. Now this isn't so hard to do. You want to make each one of those lattices the same length. So the rows are the same length. But when you sew these rows together, then you've got to do some marking. Because you see, you want to line them up. Actually, these seams should go straight across. So you want to do marking here and here so that when you pin them together, then you have continuous straight rows going throughout the quilt. Once the three rows are together, oh, there's not much left to do at all. You just need to have a strip across the top. And then the very last one is a strip across the bottom. Oh, I can't wait to finish my last six blocks and I'll show you my finished top. 
Six quilters will rest easier today because their blocks have finally been sewn into a quilt. And oh, what a quilt it is. It was so much fun to do. Now, I already layered it and did my binding, but I want to show you what I've been doing. I put a dark backing on it, and I also used a wool batting because I thought the batting should be the same as the age of the blocks. And then I safety pinned all the layers together and I did some machine quilting through the lattice first. I did straight rows this way and then I went across the other way and when I got to the intersections I just raised my presser foot and went over and started again. But now the blocks are completely anchored through the center of the quilt. And if I want to, I can go back and do some stitch in a ditch around each one of the blocks. Gosh, I might even do some hand quilting. That would really finish it off perfectly. Now I'm up to the last part of the binding and I just wanted to show you how to do it. This is a three inch wide strip of binding that I seam together lengthwise and then I folded it in half so that the wrong side is in the middle. Now I have my walking foot on, and I'm just using an extra long stitch. This is about, oh, 3.1, 3.7, and this wool batting is just wonderful to work with because it's considerably lighter in weight. And with all these safety pins in here, I can just move it around. Okay, I'm about 1 fourth inch away from the end, so all I wanna do is just stop, raise my presser foot right in this corner, Drop that foot back down again, oh, hold on to that quilt, and just reverse sew right off of it. This is to show you that mitered corner. And then right here, just raise this piece up and line it up so that it's at a perfect 90 degree angle. And then just hold that tight, fold that back down. Oh, this is the tricky part. Got to get a nice straight fold right there. And then just keep on going right around. Now, as soon as I go the whole way around, I'm going to go ahead and trim up that batting to the outside edge. But I'm just right up to where I started. So I'm just going to stop and show you how to finish it. Now, right here, let's just go ahead and clip these threads. This is where I started. And let's just go ahead. I'm going to trim off a little bit so I can show you how to work with that. As you're coming around with that next strip, Fold this back and overlap it, whatever your seam allowance is, approximately a half inch. Overlap that right there, then just take your scissors at the fold and cut it. Now, you're going to take this, free it loose, and put it right sides together and fold it. Oh, if I can get that unfolded. And just seam this together right in this edge and then put it back down on the quilt and just finish sewing along there. And that'll finish that off so it's a great flat finish. Now, all you need to do, these scissors are just great for cutting along. Cut the backing up to the binding, right up to the edge. Trim on all four sides. Oh, this is the tricky part right here. Don't cut into that corner. Trim it away. And then once you've got it completely trimmed, you're just gonna go ahead and Flip this out like this. Oh, that is perfect. And then from the wrong side, pin this in place. Line this up so that your, your binding covers that previous line of stitching. You might want to just go ahead and do some straight pins along here. I also like to use that fusing thread and just press this down so that you don't have to do all the pinning. But right here, tuck that in. And then from the right side, go ahead and just stitch in the ditch all around that outside edge. Or if you'd like to, you can go ahead and finish it by hand, do some slip stitching on the back. Remember to put a label on the back. Loretta Smith hosted a block party swap with her online quilting friends called Ships Ahoy. She sewed the blocks of ships and boats into one beautiful quilt. Oh, she loves it. Well, actually, she received blocks from 25 different friends, and many of the blocks had letters attached. Oh, it was just a great way to get to know her friends across the country. It's a beautiful one. Another one here, she had a great time reading about them. Well, Loretta hosted and participated in many block swaps. This one is, this particular one is a flying geese swap, and boy, does she have a stack of blocks to sew together. But she enjoyed the first one. She can't wait to get into these. What a great stack. 
Well, you might want to participate in another swap. This one is the Sunbonnet calendar quilt. Perhaps you and your friends might like to join together and make Sunbonnet for a different month of the year. Oh, she's so fun. She's having her Valentine's or her wedding or whatever. Just exchange them with your friends. Then go ahead and sew them together with a lattice and a frame. Well, why don't you just gather your blocks, swap your blocks, and sew them together into a great quilt. <laughs>